And it's cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. A little bit of a dip in these markets. Are we building up for a gentle bubble? I've never seen a gentle bubble. We can discuss. Countdown to the open kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up in the show, futures moving lower ahead of more crucial economic data. Rate cut bets converge. Traders finally capitulate and stop fighting the Fed. And President Biden and Donald Trump edge closer to the rematch. We begin with a big issue, the bond markets. Are they starting to capitulate? Really, what's happened in the bond market is it looks like the market got ahead of itself. It said, OK, this is over. Let's throw in the towel. Rates are going to go lower. Time to buy yields. And what's really happened is, is we're not there yet. And thus, we've seen a very strong movement in yields upward again. We've come back to a short positioning in fixed income because those moves have been pretty strong. And we're still trying to figure out what is the equilibrium, equilibrium rate in that environment for higher for longer. Joining me now, it's Morgan Stanley's Jim Caron to talk about these markets. Jim, good to have you with us. Do you get a sense that those bond rate bulls have capitulated? So I, I think we're in the process of capitulation. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't put it in the past tense. Um, effectively, what we're seeing is that inflation is coming down, but it may not be coming down as fast as what was hoped. And, you know, as people have been saying, we started the year with with people relatively long fixed income. There were over six rate cuts already priced in. Ten year yields were below four percent. And now we're at a stage where many people are starting to push back on this and, and effectively starting to believe that, well, maybe the Fed doesn't you know, cut rates in March. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, but maybe it's June. And then the question is, well, maybe you know, what if it's even later than that? So I think we're in this process of capitulation. And, and I do think that the risk is for the markets that bond yields move even higher. And I would argue that it's a risk case scenario that we could even get up to about a 4.5 to 4.6 10-year yield. I'm not forecasting that, but I'm saying that it's, 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 it's not an unlikely possibility if we continue to get inflation numbers that are not coming down as fast as hoped and the Fed continues to kick the can down the road and decides not to cut anytime soon. And this would be your base case, isn't it? That inflation is not cooperating and that makes it much more difficult to call the top of these markets. Let's welcome our next guest in. It is Mike Schumacher. He joins me uh, for the very latest. So there we are. We're debating whether we are, uh, and, and quite rightly, uh, Jim corrects me, we haven't capitulated. It is not the past tense. We may be in the present tense. I live in the present, which is we're in the process of capitulating. Give me your, your thoughts this morning, Mike, as we see uh, this potential shift in the rates markets. We've come back to 80 basis points cut. David Solomon saw it, summed it up beautifully. We're changing our mind every two minutes. Good morning. Thanks, Manus. I appreciate it. And with respect to the amount of rate cuts the Fed will do, I think people are too hung up on when exactly that first cut happens. So whether it's May, June, July, most reviewers are sort of indifferent. Yeah, you know, the bond nerds like me, we care, but most people probably don't. As long as it's in that general time frame, it doesn't matter too much. The bigger thing for us is that when the Fed first gets that cut done, so people say, oh, now it's an easing cycle, then we think the market will price a lot more rate cuts than we have in place today. So for instance, typical cycle, Fed cuts about 200 basis points in the first year. We think that's still in play here. The market, if you look from June of this year to June of next year, is priced for maybe 115, 120. That's pretty light. So we do think yields come down, but they probably meander until that first rate cut. Well, it's the debate, isn't it, whether it is the escalator or the elevator, and a lot of people are pushing back against the elevator straight to the ground floor. Gentlemen, stand by, because we are bracing for this week's pivotal uh, data point. Excuse the pun. It's the Fed's inflation measure. It comes out tomorrow, and we're going to digest what that data means tomorrow. But in the meantime, we have a little bit more on our breakfast plates. Mike McKee is with me. Mike, good day. Good morning, Manus. You live in the present. Bond traders live in the future, and we all do it by looking at the past. 
which is what we got today. Fourth quarter GDP revised, revised a little bit uh, lower to 3.2% from 3.3%, but consumer spending and business spending were both revised significantly higher, suggesting that the economy had momentum going into the first quarter. The uh, inventories number is the one that really pushed down the uh, number by a tenth, falling by almost $20 billion during the month. That's not likely to be repeated. We also get some quarterly inflation data, the PCE numbers. This is not what we get tomorrow. This is the three-month annualized version of that on a month-by-month -month basis, and it does show that we're continuing to see progress on inflation. But this isn't, as I said, what the Fed looks at. They're going to be looking tomorrow at the income spending and PCE report. And what we have there is a forecast for uh, slightly falling inflation on a year-over-year -year basis, even though we have higher month-over-month -month inflation. Now, that four-tenths increase in the PCE core for January that's forecast, a lot of people think it might be five, and that would push inflation higher for the year. This is all because of that CPI, PPI beat earlier in the uh, month. Incomes expected to be up, spending expected to be down. The Fed will be watching that to see what's going on. Uh, before we go, uh, because we got a lot of Fed speak these days. I want to point out something that um, just came up this morning. Bloomberg News' uh, Katerina Sariva has interviewed uh, Lori Logan from the Dallas uh, Fed Bank. And uh, Lori used to run the open market account at the New York Fed. And she had an interesting comment that maybe markets had taken her wrong when they thought that she said we should stop QT soon. She said she's surprised the market reaction connected slowing to stopping. We need to disconnect those con concepts. Slowing doesn't mean stopping, but just means managing the pace. So while the Fed may in March be talking about slowing QT, uh, the person who markets attributed the idea of stopping to says, no, that's not the case. Okay, well, that's going to have a, 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 an impact. Mike, thank you very much. We've got data and an interpretation. Jim Caron, Mike Schumacher are my guests this morning. Mike, let me take it back to you. Uh, you are, you, in your own words, you're the, bon, you're the, bon, the bond-focused man here. Uh, when you listen to the nuance from Laurie Logan, she's not talking about stopping QE. She's talking about the nuances of slowing it down. Does that throw a fresh complexion for the bond market this morning? Should we pay more attention to this? It is a nuanced point. I think Mike McKee's got it, got it right here. And Lori Logan's the guru at the Fed. I certainly acknowledge that point. So people in the markets probably are getting a little bit ahead of themselves thinking about QT taper versus QT stopping. They are different things. And part of the reason there's some confusion is the RRP program is relatively new. No one really knows what that critically low level is. So the Fed is trying to learn. Markets are trying to learn. So whenever Lori Logan or someone in a similar seat speaks, people are going to adjust their expectations. It's not a great answer, but I think the, the move toward QT tapering, it seems likely fairly soon, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, well, it's taken us 10 years to understand exactly the implications of QT in the first instance, or QE. Um, so it's going to take us more than a couple of months to understand the real impact of QT. Mike, can I just push you a little bit further? You said the market's pricing in 120, 150 basis points of cuts in the first year. Typically, you say that's 200 basis points. Um, would it take some kind of an exogenous shock? I don't know. I, I mean, commercial real estate. It could be another regional bank. It could, I, I mean, you can throw any black swan up there um, and conjecture. But would it take something strenuous in the system to deliver 200 basis points of cuts? No, we think not. So the reason why the Fed might do something like 200 in the first year this time is real rates are very high. So you think about the Fed funds rate in nominal terms, the effective funds rate's 533. Inflation probably stabilizes low to mid twos. So call it 3% real, maybe a little bit less. If you look at the 10-year rate, the real yield's about 2%. Those rates are exceptionally high. And if they stay high for much longer, they're going to inflict economic damage, which probably is unnecessary, call it six, nine, 12 months down the road. So the Fed can try to get ahead of that, and it's got ample room to cut a bunch and still maintain restrictive policy. It's a more nuanced argument than the Fed normally makes. Typically what happens is something breaks, the Fed eases to fix the damage. This time it would come in somewhat aggressively versus market expectations to try and forestall future damage. So we think there's plenty of room. 
Okay, and of course, now the equity markets are still maintaining their stoic resistance despite the rates probability coming down to 80 basis points of a cut. I want to tune in to what Amundi's CIO had to say this morning about pressure building on the equity market. Let's just take a listen. The pressure is high because uh, we see more and more uh, brokers actually, banks, but also clients which are uh, capitulating in a way. Uh, wanting to, to catch up uh, the momentum and, and feeling uncomfortable not being um, uh, overweight equities. He goes on to say that equities are overpriced by 20%, Jim, which takes me to you. that There is this burdening pressure um, to be in this market, to be long some kind of MAG7 con conjugation, some kind of breadth in the 493. You're adding to develop market equities. You are overweight. And your thesis is, I have a job, I'm well paid, I can spend baby spend. Well, you know, I, I think it's really a question of where we think earnings are actually going. So one of the things that we always get asked is, where do you think the equity market's going to be at the end of this year? So on December 31, 2024, what's the price? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at one year forward earnings at the end of this year. So really, I'm going to look at all of 2025 earnings estimates for what that, you know, for, for, for what that might be. And then I'm going to multiply it times a PE ratio, which is somewhere around 19 and a half. So effectively, bottoms up consensus earnings for 2025 is about $275, actually $276. Um, if inflation's coming down, if we're if we're in a more stable PE environment, if Mike Schumacher is right that the Fed's going to control this in, in, in a good fashion, then multiples can probably stay into that you know 19, 19 and a half level. Mm -hmm. Then if I multiply the 19 and a half PE times a 275, I get a number on the S and P for some somewhere around 5350, 5380, and essentially that is what the market is is figuring out if it believes that that we're going to get those forward earnings one year out and and essentially the more data that comes through that's not weak the more the likelihood is that we don't fall into a hard landing the more believable that 275 number is for 2025 mm -hmm. and then we just have to debate what the multiple is and effectively it, it tells me that it's hard to be underweight or or push or push to an underweight in equities right now unless you're just you know, betting on some unforeseen, you know, event or or something like that. And I would argue that actually bond markets might actually be a little bit more overvalued than equity markets right now. So I would I would disagree a bit with, um, you know, my colleague from a Monday. That's that, that, that's fine. That's that's what healthy discourse is and a bid and an offer. Mike, now, let me just take it straight back to you, because David Solomon said this. There's such a high consensus, such a high correlation uh, around this narrative that we're going for the soft landing. It's got a very high delta to a soft landing. And my own view is that it may be, may be a little bit more uncertain than that. Do you see any evidence that it's uh, going to be a bumpier road into the back of 2024? Because right now markets are priced to the soft landing Goldilocks briefly, sir. Yeah, we do think there's a decent chance it's bumpy. I would say it's already a little bit bumpy when you think about the CPI print high. Obviously, a jobs report last month was very strong. And this probably shouldn't surprise anybody too much. When you think about the backdrop over the last three years, what have we had? Amazing increases in inflation globally, not just in the U.S., huge drops. Is it really too far-fetched to think that getting inflation down from three-plus to low twos is going to be a challenge in a lot of countries? I think it's not. And also, you still got the residual impact of COVID in terms of nearshoring, onshoring, whatever you want to call it. That's probably inflationary, but the effects aren't all that clear cut. So a bumpy road, that seems pretty likely to us. Okay, gents, thank you very much. We've got a little bit more work to do. Don't hang up your, your Zoom line just yet. Jim Caron and Mike Schumacher, my guest this morning. Let's get under the hood of these equity markets. We've got 17 minutes to run till the opening cash bell. Abby is with me. Well, Manus, overall, we do have the stock futures down modestly. This has to do with something we haven't seen in a while. NVIDIA down more than uh, 1%. But let's take a look, and you can see that there on the bottom of the board there, down 1.2%. Uh, Apple not down so much, but it's worth mentioning because uh, we do have this small move, but on big news, of 
course, they are abandoning their decade-long plan to develop an electric car. Investors, not a lot of stock reaction because it was not never in the financials, but certainly a headline reaction. Beyond me, take a look at how much the stock is soaring up 60 percent, the pandemic, darling, getting a nice bounce on revenues being 10 percent better, changes to the portfolio. There is a 39 percent bear short interest, so much of that I'm betting is a squeeze. And then finally, the crypto rally continues. We have Bitcoin back above 60,000 uh, K, the highest level since uh, November of 2021, and it's taking those crypto stocks right along with it, Manus. Yeah, uh, and a number of people speculating that we could have a gentle bubble. I've never seen a bubble burst gently. Capital groups say that. Coming up on the show, Abby, thank you very much. we got optimism in Washington. We have been working in good faith around the clock every single day for months and, and weeks and over the last several days, quite literally around the clock, to get that job done. We're very optimistic. I, I hope that the other leaders came out here and told you the same. We believe that we can get to agreement on these issues and prevent a government shutdown. And that's our first uh, responsibility. From behind the closed doors of the White House, we take you into the conversation right here on Bloomberg. Productive and an intense meeting. Uh, productive meeting on the government shutdown. Um, we we are making good progress. Progress in Washington. Do you trust it? Congressional leaders expressing confidence while avoiding a shutdown, expecting to reach a deal ahead of Friday's deadline, despite the remaining hurdles. What are they? And do you believe them? I'm Ehud mean, Ern has been passing the rhetoric. Good morning, Ms. Hordan. What do you believe has changed? What shifted? Well, they're talking about progress, but really what they're trying to do is just delay, delay, delay. What they're looking to do from Punchbowl News, what we learned is that Speaker Johnson wants to move the two deadlines to instead of the 1st and the 8th through the 8th and the 22nd of March. So this would give them time to get some of those top-line figures in place. He wants to make sure there's top-line figures in place with the Democrats on four of those appropriation bills that would be due midnight on the 1st, that deadline was going to move to the 8th, because also you have to remember, he wants to make sure if he's going to put a continuing resolution on the House floor, that he can preserve his job. So he has to show the hard right flank of the Republican Party that he is working to try to get a more fiscally healthy, what they would call budget, and potentially some of these policy riders, man, is how much can the Republicans extract from the Democrats? That remains to be seen, but it does look like they are kicking the can down the road, and they need to, because there are some Republicans that have really tough not just primary races, but races coming in November to win re-election. And if you have a government shutdown, some employees are not going to get paychecks. And speaking of some of those difficult races in some of these swing districts, yesterday we did have a swing state with a primary, and that was Michigan. And that shows by uh, uh, madness for both Biden and Trump some general election issues. The former president is still not getting 70% uh, of the vote. He's more closer to 60% of the vote in all of the past primaries. So he has some more work to do to show up the Republican voters into the general. And then for Biden, more than 13%, that's more than 100,000 voters in Michigan voted uncommitted. A lot more work needs to be due with gen the younger generation, progressives, and as uh, Arab and Muslim Americans, because they do not like right now what he's doing in Gaza, and that was a protest vote to the White House. Yeah, a very clear protest vote, Amri. Wonderful what self-preservation does for a politician in terms of getting deals done. Amri Hordern, thank you very much. Jim Caron, Mike Schumacher are my guests. I mean, a shutdown in of itself, Mike, does not shake the market. When does another message from the ratings agencies shake a politician into understanding what fiscal policy should be? Yeah, you probably have to wait for the debt ceiling battle, which is coming. So the debt ceiling has been pushed out to Jan 1. Sometime after that, you'll get, a, am sure, a contentious battle. So perhaps Manus in the lame duck session of Congress. But if that seems to go badly, you'll get more, I suspect, more pressure from the rating agencies. So I think we get to wait until that. It's not so much the shutdown, it's the debt ceiling. I wouldn't imagine, Jim, you know, this, this market isn't going to be terribly worried about this shutdown. But what I do want to get a sense from you both just very, very quickly is we've got this plateauing in rates at the moment. We look at the political situation. How does it stack up for the dollar, Jim, in your mind? 
So, I mean, on paper, all of this should be dollar negative. But the issue that we have is when we look around the world, the U.S. still has very high real rates. You know, Mike Schumacher was just talking about that right now. That makes the dollar attractive on a relative basis to other currencies. Um, U.S. equity markets, U.S. asset prices are actually doing relatively well versus other markets around the world. So there's an attraction to own the dollar, to own the U.S. assets. So those two things override what is what should fundamentally be a, a dollar negative. It really turns into a bit of a dollar positive. So our view on the dollar here is, is relatively neutral. We don't have a very strong view. We don't think it's going to collapse. We don't think it's going to necessarily accelerate. We think it's really just going to move a bit sideways. Yeah, I had, I had BMO this morning with me talking about the high correlation trades, and he's worried about, about the barbell. Um, Mike, can I just close it off with you? Extrapolate forward. We're going to Super Tuesday. The narrative is it could be a Trump victory in the White House and a sweep for the GOP. What would that do to the dollar? Briefly, in 60 seconds, Jim. Mike, sorry, oh. Mike, my apologies. Yeah, it should be dollar positive. So you think about Trump won, what do we have? Trade war, a lot of restrictions, a lot of talk about NAFTA, which became USMCA, a lot of saber rattling. Probably get more of the same. People look to the U.S. dollar as a, a haven, a place of strength. So I think that's dollar positive in that particular case. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. Let's see uh, how it all falls down as we head towards Super Tuesday and uh, the risk of a government shutdown. Jim Caron, Mike Schumacher. My guest this morning on The Markets. Coming up, morning calls for you. A conversation with Sarah Hunt of Alpine Saxon Wood. She joins me around the opening bell to discuss her outlook for the equity market. She breathed a sigh of relief when NVIDIA delivered their results. Should we continue to breathe easy? Good morning from New York. a daily vicissitudes of what drives the market. NVIDIA is down 1%. You have the results, you have the glory, and, and yet we, we managed to look at markets through the prism of one stock, never mind the Magnificent Seven. We're now down to the daily vicissitudes of what NVIDIA does to drive this market. That is a dangerous place to be, and it has the hallmarks of something that is not built on huge strength. We can debate that with Sarah uh, Hunt when she joins me in a moment. Spoos are down a third of 1%, Nasdaq down a half of 1%. These bond markets are topping out uh, at uh, the current level. We need the PC to come in hot to drive them higher. Some notes for you from the Wall Street scribes. Bernstein downgrades Stellantis to market perform. They see limited upside after recent gains. Next up, Stifel upgrades J.M. Schmucker to a buy, highlighting the compelling valuation, the potential for near-term growth, and finally, Loop Capital initiates coverage on Dell Technology, a buy rating, expecting the company to benefit from, you got it, general AI trends. Sarah Hunt will join me next. How dangerous a place are we with our obsession and myopic focus on NVIDIA? Good morning from New York. Mike Schumacher on from Wells Fargo. He says, do expect up to 200 basis points of cuts over the next year. This rates market has underpriced the rates cuts. They're still quite exuberant at Goldman Sachs Asset Management. These equity markets are nervous. NVIDIA is lighter by 1%. So a lot of the earnings stories that are coming through at the moment. But for now, we pause for thought on this technology-infused rally across markets. Uh, and in terms of the rest of the assets, I really want to look at that Bitcoin. We've actually changed the total rundown. There you go. Bitcoin made it onto the asset display because she cracks 60,000, up 39% in the month. The biggest monthly gain since October 2021. This is a rising tide across assets. And the question is, uh, are we building up a little bit too far and too fast? Rates remain unchanged, 429. There may be a little bit of a further back up in rates uh, as we go towards the PCE and afterwards. And oil is up by a half of 1%, despite the build in stockpiles in Cushing, Oklahoma, uh, up 8 million barrels. And a warning uh, that China oil demand could be in a low growth phase. Doesn't seem to knock the market for now. One stock we are watching. It is eBay. The company reported a strong holiday quarter, expanding its share buyback. Yep, 
That word again, a share buyback of $2 billion. Abigail Doolittle is with me on the note. Well, investors are really liking this quarter and that buyback, man. As shares are popping higher, up more than 6%, heading to the best day since November of 2022. So relative to the quarter that was, as you mentioned, it was a strong quarter, a strong holiday quarter. Uh, they beat both top and bottom line estimates. In addition, relative uh, to the buyback, they added $2 billion to it. So there's now a total of $3.7 billion in that buyback. Uh, but on this solid quarter, the hopes are really for the future, because if you recall last month, they cut about 9% of their workforce, about 1,000 people. So the thought is if they can continue to have strong sales and compete with the likes of Amazon, uh, those cost cuts will flow to the bottom line. They really are in some niche markets such as watches, sneakers, and luxury items for collectors. They also sell authentication services designed to root out counterfeits. Uh, and if you can believe this uh, online, refurbished appliances and car parts uh, for the cost-conscious American. Now, you put all this together with those cost cuts and investors probably hoping that this stock can finally uh, pop out of a greater than year long range between about let's call it 40 to 50 uh, today not quite there but nonetheless up five percent i've got to join this whole car this whole car revolution i haven't had a car in eight years uh, abby thank you very much abby will do a little stick with the earnings front baidu's profit cut almost in half after this spending on ai to keep up with the market alex seminova joins me so spend on ai but there is a risk associated with that. Indeed, Manus, some back and forth action for Baidu this morning. Shares now falling into the open. It fell, then rose, then fell again in pre-market trading after a mixed earnings readout. Baidu, which is, of course, China's dominant search engine, reported revenue growth of 6% on artificial intelligence applications and its ad business. That was, however, overshadowed by a 48% profit plunge. Profits nearly halved, underscoring how costly it is to train and develop AI as companies foray into this area. Area. Baidu does, of course, make the bulk of its profits from its ad business, but as China's economy slows and consumers cut back spending, it has been uh, foraying into AI, joining the likes, of course, of Silicon Valley peers like Google. Its chat GPT style service attracted 100 million users and now gives a premium tier that charges a monthly subscription, uh, giving it a head start against some rivals in China. It has, however, had a difficult time. Shares have dropped nearly 30 percent since July lie in Hong Kong on concerns about that ad business and the costs of AI. Analysts at Bernstein say successfully revamping its AI apps are the most critical part for Beidou's AI story. Manis. Well, everybody wants to know what your AI strategy is. Alex, thank you very much. More earnings this time on the retail front. You've had a few already this week, but Urban Outfitters missing their estimates due to a slowdown in January across the brands. Isabel Lee has more on the story. Stock under pressure this morning. Isabel. Definitely under pressure, Manus, because it's a miss on the top and the bottom line for Urban Outfitters. During the pre-market trading, shares were down as much as 11%, and now we see some pairing back of those losses, but still down around 7%. So we have the clothing retailer reporting adjusted EPS that missed estimates, and City attributed this to weaker comparable sales and gross margin due to a slowdown in January across all its brands. City did say that it expects improvements for the brand this year. So we have adjusted EPS at 50 cents. That's lower than the 74 cents estimate. The bottom line did increase in the previous quarter, and we have net sales at $1.49 billion, which is in line with estimates. So Urban Outfitters is an umbrella for a lot of brands like Urban Outfitters, the namesake, Anthropology and Free People. The namesake brand beat sales expectations, but Anthropology and Free People kind of fell short. Despite that, we have the CEO telling investors that the spring offering usually bodes well for the company. So I guess we have to look out for their fashion choices. And we also have Telsey Advisory Group, though, being slightly optimistic optimistic towards the progress that the company will be making this year. It also raised the price target of Urban Outfitters as well as BMO. And sales now, shares now are continuing its plunge down around 10%. But in the past 12 months, Manus, the stock is up around 75%. Go Urban Outfitters. As well, thank you very much. Uh, just coming off that massive rally. Let's stick with the retail earnings. TJX delivering what could be called a tepid outlook. Its annual sales forecast misses the estimates of own Foxman has more. Simone, what's going on at TJ Maxx? Yeah, once again, we are hearing from a retailer that says the fourth quarter, uh, in this case, which ended at the beginning of February, was really excellent, 
but the coming year is looking a little soft. And this uh, TJX, the owner of TJ Maxx, Marshalls, Home Goods. Um, so sales topping estimates in the fourth quarter up 13% year on year. Comp sales up 5%. The estimate had been 4%, and the company had guided 2 to 3%. So that is a very strong beat. And a lot of actually enthusiasm coming from home goods, which seems odd since consumers have seemed reluctant to spend on their homes, just considering the uh, high interest rate environment. Uh, also saw profit margins coming in strong at nearly 30%. William Blair called this a healthy beat. They pointed out the volume of consumer transactions. But to that guidance there, 2 to 3% uh, comp sales expected both in the first quarter, especially maybe on the back of a, a, a slow January, uh, sorry, a slow February, uh, and then uh, comp sales looking for full year to 2 to 3%. The estimate had been close to 4% on both of those. Company will increase its dividend. That not really helping shares today, but City, Bloomberg Intelligence, all immediately out with notes saying they believe that this guidance is conservative. And it is worth noting that shares of TJX hit a record high yesterday. So maybe we've just seen the enthusiasm top out here. Believe, Simone. Believe in the <laughs> retailer, I say. Uh, Simone Foxman there uh, with the very latest on TJX. Sarah Hunt is Alpine Saxon Woods. Uh, she's navigating what lies ahead, telling the market this. The market reacted positively and well to NVIDIA earnings last week, and we had a sigh of relief and heard around the investment table. It was palpable. Sarah joins me now. Sarah, it is. it, it really was. It was the build up to the crescendo. Then we got the numbers. Then we breathed a sigh of relief. I look at what the CTA does. They piled in. They put 15 to 20 billion dollars more into the markets post NVIDIA. What action did you take when you had that sigh of relief? Well, I think that everybody was waiting to see what was going to happen there. I mean, Microsoft had already put up good numbers and AI was a part of that. I mean, NVIDIA is really just the poster child for what's happening in AI. And that story has really driven the market. We were already fairly well positioned into that. But I think that the question is, is always about going forward. Had there been a problem, however, I think that the equity markets would have had more trouble than just the fact that it was NVIDIA. I think it would have that, that story would have started to have some cracks in it. And so far, that story is still looking pretty good. And that's been positive for equities. When I look at these markets, I look at through the prism of, of the average investor, which is I for future, for 401k and retirement. And the greatest risk of all is, oh my gosh, are they going to dump all my capital in all at one go? And that's into the highs. Do I just hope for a bit of a correction? I mean, some people are talking about, you know, a gentle bubble. I mean, you can miss out if you sit too long waiting for a gentle bubble to explode. You can, and I think, I mean, this is, this is part of the reason why so much of that kind of investing is done on a monthly basis, where you're putting in, especially for 401ks, you're putting in money all during the year. Because it is very difficult to start if you had zero money invested and look at this market and say, I want to put 100% of my money into it. But even when you do get new investors, you start to, you put money to work in tranches so that you, if there is any kind of a pullback, you get to take advantage of that. But also, if the market keeps going up, you're not just continuously left behind. And that's really been the issue for the last year and a half. I mean, it, since 2023, when the market really took off, especially on the tech side, that's been a problem because waiting for pullbacks, they haven't lasted very long and you'd have to be very nimble to catch them. So that's where that's where monthly investing comes in handy when you're participating in a 401k. It does indeed. There's a couple of things that have come to my mind this morning. One is from David Solomon over at Goldman Sachs. He says, he spoke at the UBS conference yesterday, so we've dealt with his view on the high delta for soft landing. Consumers are now living paycheck to paycheck. Spending behaviors of that nature are coming to the fore. I'm also looking at mortgage data this morning, which is virtually ground to a halt. The two idiosyncratic pieces, one is subjective and one is data. But they are nonetheless, I say, quite telling. The big problem, I think, going forward is that if you see any issues in the labor market, you are back to the point where, especially on the low end, the consumer is quite up against it with higher prices and higher cost of living. And I think that this is where, if you start to see any labor issues, the market's going to, going to take that and say the consumer cannot keep spending if they lose their job because we're back to a situation where a lot of that pandemic excess savings has been spent 
And wages have risen, but they haven't necessarily risen commensurately with inflation. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes a real tension. And I think that that's where, especially on the lower end on the consumer, that's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of problems there. Are you surprised by that job? We're just showing it. The home buying near the lowest level since 1995. I just got a mortgage in Not 1995, really. and it was about 6 6.5% in pounds. So I'm used to that number, but this world is not. I think that's the problem. Is that not only is the world not used to it, but because we were, because many people were able to refinance their mortgages at lower rates, you have a big group of people holding on to mortgages that have a lower number to them, and the people who are trying to buy the pricing hasn't come down enough to make those higher interest rates affordable, and that's the problem. Affordability is really not helping anybody right here, and this is one of the tensions in inflation numbers, right? Because as the owner equivalent rent keep going higher, that t it's harder to bring inflation down. And that's become a consistent issue. We have lower housing stock, and it's very difficult, again, to see turnover in the existing home market, which is why you've seen much higher numbers relatively on percentages for new home sales. You and I have, have talked before about robust balance sheets, look beyond Magnificent 7, et cetera, when it comes to discerning where you want to be. But you would make the point even stronger now is that robust balance sheets outside of tech are going to become even more important. So where, where do you see those opportunities, Sarah? There's some good places. I mean, I know that we've talked about energy before. There's some good places there where you're seeing cash flow and you're seeing good balance sheets. I think even in some of the retailers, I mean, for the fact that TJ Maxx is going to up its dividend and increase its buyback tells you that they've got a strong cash flow situation. I think if rates are going to stay higher for longer, and certainly the way the curve is interpreting what the Fed has said and what the economy do, is doing is that that is going to be the case. And again, people start really looking at those balance sheets because nobody wants to be in the in the position where they have to raise a lot of debt in a higher expensive, in a higher interest rate environment. So I think if this is really going to come more and more to the fore as valuations start to become on in other parts of the market as important as some of those cash flows on the tech side. What do you take away from the nuances? Capital Group says we have a gentle bubble. I've never seen a gentle bubble burst in my life. Kathy Wood is slicing some of her chip holdings into this rising tide. Again, th these are very subjective opinions and actions, and we usually get the actions after you know, the horse has bolted. But is there merit, Sarah, at any level? We're trying to decide whether to go all in at record highs or to shave back risk at some juncture. It's, it's a very, very hard call to manage, isn't it? It's a hard call to manage, and, and as one of my colleagues likes to remind me, there's no, there's nothing wrong in making some money in stocks and taking some money off the table, too. I think the harder question is, really, where is everything, where are all the assets going? And this is where there's been a lot of tension right now. And to the extent that technology just continues to permeate our lives in ways that we weren't aware of, nor do we sometimes even want. You don't need a refrigerator full of semiconductors, but you're getting one anyway. There is a consistent growth in unit volume in some of those areas that's not going to go away necessarily. And I think that that's where people are trying to figure out how much of this is short term, how much of this is much longer term. And unlike the dot-com bubble, which has been, you know, there's been a lot of parallels made, at least there's a lot of earnings backing up and a lot of cash flow yeah. backing up what's going on right now, even though some folks are obviously putting AI into anything just to make it to be part of that story. But it's not as bad as it was in the previous cycle when you had a lot of money chasing very few profits. At least now you've got a lot of cash flow behind some of this. You have indeed. And the one thing I'm looking at is I just run, anybody who's got a Bloomberg terminal, run NI hot and have a look at the word buybacks. It, it's the most splendid roll call of everything under the sun. BMW, Munich Re, Baidu, uh, along with BP uh, and, uh, and Meta. It's a heck of a roll call on the buyback front. Sarah, we can talk about buybacks next time you're with me. That's Sarah Hunt, Alpine, Saxon, Woods, my guest this morning. Coming up, Apple slams the brakes on its EV venture. We sort of see it as the mother of all AI projects. It's probably one of the most difficult AI projects actually to, to work on. A bit more on the details on that brake slamming move and the shift to more AI at Apple on Bloomberg.
We sort of see it as the mother of all AI projects. It's probably one of the most difficult AI projects actually to, to work on. And so autonomy is something that's incredibly uh, exciting for us. And uh, but we'll, we'll see where it takes us. That was Tim Cook a few years ago speaking to Bloomberg on the aspirations. That was 2017. Today it's 2024. That was the big plan and the big idea. Those ideas have been scrapped. It's a decade long effort for the company to shift into gear in the auto industry with EVs. Now the pivot is to do more in AI. How the world has changed. Ed Ludlow, good morning. Good to see you. I mean, this is pragmatism in terms of capital deployment. Yeah, it's pragmatism, but it also shows you that you can have $170 billion of cash on your balance sheet and it makes not one bit of difference to your ambitions. You know, Apple's down four tenths of a percent. When Mark Gurman broke the story yesterday, it did take a little spike higher. And what we're learning is that the 2,000 or so people working on the Apple car project will either unfortunately lose their job or be shifted to a different team within Apple working on their generative AI efforts. That soundbite that you just played from Tim Cook from 2017 speaks to the story, which was Apple never really arrived at what product it wanted to build. You know, we reported recently that there had been a shift from aiming for a kind of all singing, all dancing, completely self-driving robo-taxi and pairing back those ambitions to having something more like a level two plus uh, consumer car, like higher spec, in line with the kind of premium product emblem that iPhone and MacBook has. Um, you know, a lot of people that I've spoken to throughout California in the automotive, but also AI industries have interviewed at Apple at one time or another in the last two years to work on that car project. You know, at one time there were 5,000 people working on it. Uh, 2,000 now kind of face an uncertain future. But this is them, uh, you know, ripping the Band-Aid, as Dan Ives put it. I would say that a number of analysts on the street note this is probably potential upside for Tesla, because had Apple ever got there, it's Tesla they'd be competing with, not with the, the legacy names like GM and Ford. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's still, it's, it's, it's a big shift, and, and to a certain extent, it, it puts more pressure on, on the team to come up with innovation on product. It took me through what's going on at Google in terms of their AI. It's not behaving yes. exactly as it's supposed to? Yeah, and I would also point out Alphabet shares are now down 2% in the session. They were down 4.5% Monday with a reprieve yesterday. Sundar Pichai sent out a memo to staff overnight, basically one acknowledging that uh, results from Gemini, both text and image results, had caused offense. He labeled them as totally unacceptable. And what he explained to staff in the memo is that Google, Alphabet, the parent of Google, got this wrong, that the generative AI tool has some inherent issues that, that are leading to inaccuracies and, and, and problems of bias. And so now teams are working around the clock. Uh, you know, read the memo that, that's printed in full by Bloomberg, but they are working to fix this. And, you know, one analyst I spoke to yesterday from Elias Research basically said, this is an issue of trust, right? Because if you think about the story of AI yeah. with Google, it's about putting it in their other products. They've got a black eye now on the trust issue. How do we feel then about YouTube and search, things like that? Okay, well, we'll keep an eye on it. Ed, thank you very much. Ed Ludlow there with the very latest uh, on Alphabet. Some sector price action for you this morning. Abigail Doolittle is in the studio. Abby. Well, man, as we are looking at a small decline for the S&P 500, nonetheless, we have more sectors higher than not led by energy, financials, industrials. To the downside, though, we have do have tech. You were mentioning earlier that NVIDIA down by about 1% dragging. We also have communication services down about 8 tenths of 1%. Now, dragging on communication services are a number of names. Most of the stocks in that index are down, including Paramount on uh, the news uh, that the deal uh, with Warner Brothers or talk deal talk uh, has really been halted right now. But one stock that is not going in that trend, take a look at Disney up about three tenths of one percent. And this, of course, amid the announcement earlier today that they are creating an eight point five billion dollar streaming alliance in India. And then we have discretionary just about flat. Take a look at Wendy's. The stock really not moving that much, but lots of news beneath the service, including uh, Senator Warren uh, posting on X recently about their price surging uh, plan and really not liking it. In fact, the company itself is pushing back after, quote unquote, outrage over their surge pricing uh, idea. Folks not liking the idea that supply and demand might drive the pricing over at Wendy's. OK, I mean, thank you so much. Abigail do a little coming up market moving events to set the agenda for the rest of your trading day.
nib lighter on the growth numbers for the fourth quarter, coming in at 3.2%. United Health has also done a little bit of tech uh, pressure this morning, the likes of NVIDIA, and we've just caught up with Ed on Google there. So we're nervous. We're nervous ahead of the PCE. Uh, Trading Diary, this is what we've got for you for the rest of your day. The Atlanta Fed President, Rafael Bostec, speaks at noon. Uh, Eastern, the plus, we get more Fed speak. Collins and Williams. Salesforce report their numbers after the bell. Thursday, it is the PCE. And that takes you to Friday. The risk of a partial government shutdown. The deadline, we're counting down to it. That was counting down to the open. Join me tomorrow morning. Let's see what else we can bring you on the equity market board. That's it from New York and Bloomberg. Good morning.